Today, I'm delighted to be speaking to Fiona Edwards and Katie Langdon. They are sisters and founders of healthcare creative agency Skin and Blister. They're on a mission to put the care back into healthcare communications. A very warm welcome to you both. Hi, Jenny. Jenny. It's lovely to be here. It's lovely to see you too. And I know it's been a long time coming because I wanted you to have you on the show for quite a while. So would you mind starting off by telling us why you started Skin and Blister and how you help your clients? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think Skin and Blister actually started many, many, many years ago before the actual business, if you like, because uh, Skin and Blister is London Cockney rhyming slang for sister and Katie is my sister. Um, and actually, Katie and I have got a background in healthcare communications. We've both been working in that area individually at other agencies. And actually, Skin and Blister was born from a point of shared frustration um, because we were working at other agencies and feeling like the care wasn't being put into absolutely every element. Um, so Skin and Blister basically exists because we want to improve the way that we communicate in health but for the benefit of everybody. Um, and to do this, we really try to understand who we're talking to. So it could be a healthcare professional who's about to make a life-changing treatment decision. It could be a patient who's feeling really lost or scared or frustrated about you know, the current circumstances that they're in. And we gather a lot of true insight to really understand who we're talking to and then take all the complex scientific information and make it meaningful, accessible and useful for all. Um, so Skin and Blister is a creative agency and we make remarkable healthcare communications for humans, also for animals and through our clinical trials work for the future of medicine. So that's a little bit about our business. Uh, we started five years ago officially um, and yeah, we haven't looked back really. It's just been a, a, a massive success story so far, hasn't it? And I'm sure it's set to continue. Do, would you mind, Fee, just to that point about having frustrations that you didn't think that it was, you know, in other agencies, what were a few of your key frustrations? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because Katie and I, although we're sisters, we're, we can be quite different um, in terms of the way our brains work. Um, and I actually have a background in account management and account direction and sort of the strategic side of the business client partnerships. And Katie is a creative director. So we come at it from an actually quite a different perspective. Um, but our frustrations were really about um, seeing churn out. You know, often we would see agencies say, I've got this much budget. What should we just propose? What should we do without actually thinking about the end user, if you like? You know, who's that person at the end? How are they going to benefit from what you're producing or what you're communicating? And yeah, we just got a bit tired of it, really. And I think Katie and I were actually freelance for a number of years and we were quite strategic. We were a bit naughty, really. You know, we went around loads of different agencies. We, were, To be honest, I think we were trying to find the perfect agency to work for. Couldn't quite find it. So we kept having all these conversations saying, should we just try this ourselves? Because we've got nothing to lose. So, so that's what we did. I bet you're so glad that you did as well. I am. I don't know if Katie is still. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Katie's still smiling. <laughs> so, yeah. so listen, you guys were very ahead of the curve when you proposed from the outset that you were going to work completely virtually. All right. Now, this was way before COVID, way before right. everybody else was going into this. So I would love to hear, you know, first of all, why did you choose the virtual model? So... Um, when we set up, we just had a baby. So actually, we kind of all went and then we put the brakes on. Um, and the only thing that we ever clashed about when we talked about the business was location. And for me, I live in London and I know that there's a massive creative pool here. I've worked in West London agencies and even getting, you know, freelancers and creatives from the East London is difficult. So I wanted to be connected to a city where there was a creative talent pool um, and she didn't want to commute with three young children and you know and I and I'd done the commute as well and so we kept kind of clashing and then one day we went to uh, watch Tamara Littleton do a talk and she set up an agency in her shed years and years and years ago and she actually kind of gave us the permission to just carry on doing it how we were doing it and we we everyone told us we needed an office everyone said it wouldn't work if we went virtual um, and we actually realized that day I'll never forget that day um, it is working and we just need to work really hard at it um, so that was the decision um, 
I think from that moment onwards, we knew that we had to invest in culture, we had to invest in our team, we had to invest in each other and our mental health. And we had to look at ways of, you know, developing without necessarily having that trailblazer to follow in the industry. Um, and we pulled in people from all over, you know, different, different industries, different sectors, and, you know, got as much advice as possible. Um, and, and now we're 14 of us and we're based all over the country and we're about to launch Skin of Vista 2.0. So this is an exclusive um, where we're taking on quite a few of those team members, freelancers as full-time permanent members of the Skin and Blister team. So it's really wow. exciting for us and a real indicator that it's working. Wow, huge congratulations on the expansion of the team. Honestly, if, if anyone deserves it, it's you too, because I know you. that you've really set the tone for the agency. And I think it's a bit difficult for pe- people that weren't around five years ago, maybe, to understand the mind, the fixed mindset that there was about you need an office. I mean, yeah. you know, we don't, we forget that, that this, this situation has really disrupted things. And I love the fact that, Katie, you said Fee was pregnant because personally in my career, and there's many years, I've seen so many of my friends have kids and had to leave the agency completely, the agency, agency world, because there was no place for them. They couldn't come back part-time, they couldn't be flexible, couldn't work from home, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And to think that all of that wasted talent. So I feel quite passionate about the fact that you've managed to make it work before everybody else kind of jumped on the bandwagon. So Katie, you said obviously initially there was a lot of learnings and you had to spend a lot of time thinking about culture, et cetera. I mean, what were the initial challenges that you faced when you went to this virtual model? I think... Gosh, I've been trying to think about useful kind of takeaways for other people because we get asked about this a lot as well. Um, the number one thing I would say is take a pen and paper and go start from scratch, go back to the start. Like, don't think, how do I build a physical office into a virtual world? Like, actually, we're, we're in a virtual world. So how do we start again? Like, how can the agency model build from that perspective? What do we need to do to connect each other and make sure that we're a really strong team? Um, for us, that's definitely a big part of that has been to getting to really know each other deeper. Um, and so we do things like every week we have a Tuesday morning meeting and we encourage team members to share photos of their weekend, photos of last week, um, so that people put up you know, th- photos of their world, their family, their situation, and what's outside their window and talk about Um, different things and they could be inspirational or they could be this is my kid's birthday party but actually it it brings us closer together as a team Um, and then also uh, for mental health we do a how are you feeling check-in every week and what this does is it encourages us to listen to each other and um, you know hear how we're all feeling and then pick up if anybody's struggling or if anyone's having you know a really good week we can you know we'll congratulate them and celebrate um, but it, we've reached a point now where the team are becoming very open and kind of, you know, turning up and saying, I'm having a bad day, you know, I'm having a bad week, you know, and, and then you'll watch the rest of the team rally around them. And that's very, very strong. So I think, you know, deep listening, lots of questions, um, mixing it up, trying to get to know each other in different ways. Um, and then obviously having 3D days as well. That's what we call them. So, you know, seeing people in the flesh, um you know not just on the screen um it's lovely as well and it's a real treat I I really value those times with with each team member do you know it's the first time I've heard anyone that's in charge of an agency talk at such level about feelings Mm -hmm. and I think this is so overlooked I really do getting to know people as people and I suppose it kind of your proposition about putting the care back into healthcare that equally is is how you operate internally isn't it genuinely caring about your team and that's why you've gone to 14 people in such a short period of time so uh, well done I think I I hope that doesn't sound Patrick I really genuinely believe it's the first time I've heard that and that's very very powerful Mm -hmm. so I congratulations so so in terms of challenges I mean you shared a few tips there which were fantastic Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. deep listening um encouraging people to share photos of their weekend so you get to know each other uh, Mm -hmm. personally as well how are you Mm -hmm. feeling mixing it up as well um Mm -hmm. 
these are all brilliant tips for people to start thinking about maybe how they could enhance what they're doing. Yeah. What about barriers? Like, where do you, or did you, I mean, I know things have changed now with clients, but mm. did you get any barriers from clients initially? Well, I mean, interestingly, a lot of our clients came to us at the start of the pandemic and said, can you teach us how to work? Um, I've, my personal opinion is that clients don't really care. Like, you know, the value that we offer to one of our teams in New Zealand, and often that means we're delivering work in the morning um, to clients. Um, they, they kind of love to just have the work delivered and they don't really care how it happens that's that's my opinion but the value of a team set up like this means that people work at all different times it's very flexible and very agile um, and actually I think the clients really see the benefits of that um, I, I guess in terms of barriers for me we were terrified of things like training online and developing people um, we have um, big ambitions to bring in more graduates more juniors especially for me personally in the copywriting area because we're really struggling and but there is a massive talent pool as well so um but fees genuinely a brilliant um trainer as well so i've seen fee bring team members in and they shadow her we invite them to meetings to observe and listen um we'll screen share a lot um we'll encourage video face to face and just kind of help people build their confidence as well i see nice. i don't know if you want to add anything on that but yeah, I mean, I think when we did our, one of our very first pitches, one of the questions was, as an agency of your size and your setup, is there anything you can't offer us that a big network can? And I think my cheeky response to that was, we don't have a big fancy boardroom, but apart from that, you're not going to get much of a difference. And, you know, I think there are certainly some clients who love face-to-face -face meetings, you know, obviously pre-pandemic, we were in a slightly more challenging time, but, you know, there is that aspect that some clients love that. They like that buzz of going to an agency, but we try to give them that experience virtually as much as we possibly can. You know, what Katie was saying about being open and modeling that for our team, we also do that with our clients. Um, so we've amazing, you know, got these amazing relationships now established. Um, and if we need to meet up, we'll, you know, we'll book a really lovely room somewhere or we'll get together and do some crazy golf as well as having a bit of a meeting. You know, you can make it actually so much more fun and the client is still getting that same experience of agency life, but you're not necessarily paying for it every single day to have it in an office if you don't need it. That is so true. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean that you're not going to do any face to face, quite the opposite. No, it's doing no. things face to face. And let's face it. I mean, even when I was working all those years ago, how many times did the clients come into the office? Yeah. It's kind of, they try to organize that Friday afternoon yeah. meeting, don't they? So we can all <laughs> yeah. go down the pub <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> but you talked about the benefits. I mean, obviously the, your agility, you can work in different time zones. Uh, you've obviously got experienced people managing client relationships, which is always a huge bonus. Cost savings overall. Any other benefits um, that you think that running a completely high, uh, because there is a difference. Some people are saying, like some agencies are saying, I don't want to go completely virtual. We're going to go hybrid. What do you think? Is there, what else? I'd love your thoughts on this mm. hybrid model, because I think, and I don't know what you think, I'd love to run it past you. Some, some leaders are still stuck in the mentality that it's not possible to do this all virtually, or maybe it's too much of a transition too quickly. So they've chosen the hybrid as a, well, it's a kind of halfway house. And there's probably various reasons for doing that. But what's your view on that? I mean, I, I really think it's so easy for people to kind of go, oh, you know, all juniors need to be in an office every day to learn and develop. And, you know, all mums want to be at home so that they can do the school run. That's not the case at all. And actually what we try to do at Skin and Blister is really look at the needs of each individual person and look at their strengths and then think about what they need. I mean, I had a discussion with one of the team recently and she's missing some of that face to face. She's you know she would like to kind of get together and we're going to make that happen that maybe you know once or twice a week we do get together we don't live that far away you know let's work together as well as remotely you know and yeah I think it's just trying to think about 
what everybody needs to thrive rather than trying to say let's all do it this way or let's all not do it that way it, it just in, in my experience anyway it doesn't work because everybody's so different you've got so many different personalities you've got introverts extroverts you know all these other things going on that you need to consider um but i think when what we have really found works is deadline driven working that's what we call it at skin and blister so I think a lot of agency life is long working hours. It's very hard work. Um, and we've all experienced it, haven't we? Where we've been in working on a pitch or something till 11 p.m. And then your bosses have expected you to come in for 9 a.m. bright and breezy the next day. And actually you might be sat there waiting for the pitch to start at two or something, you know, and that's just a waste of everybody's time and energy. So if you can find a way to really allow people to work where, when and how they work best, that's the dream in, in our in our opinion it certainly works for us and our team and actually I think you get the best most remarkable work as an output again I think this is a great tip actually because what you've just described is start with the team rather than starting with a policy you know and getting everyone to fit in with your policy start with understanding who you've got because particularly now I don't know if you're aware but I spoke to uh, Phil Cookson from the creative resource who's been a recruiter for 15 years or, or more actually and he said he's never seen such a shortage of particularly account managers at the moment yeah. and I think account managers have the option now of looking at different cultures of agencies they don't want to be in the sweatshop they don't want to be in the top-down approach they're interested in understanding how the leaders think about uh, work-life balance about mental health etc so I think this is a really good message, I think, for other agency leaders, just to give some ideas on how you have approached this, because it seems to me like the perfect way of doing it. Katie, did you want to add something? Yeah, just to say that I think as well, the power of our model comes from the understanding that Fee and I have that outside, you know, Fee's a mum and we do employ a lot of parents and that's because our model works well with that. But alongside that I have an understanding of what it like what it's like to be a working parent in our industry equally Fee has an understanding of what it's like to be a single um, person who doesn't have children in our industry and lives in London and you know wants to tap into networks there and I think there are leaders in our industry that find it hard to see kind of past what's come before and also past their own circumstances um, I think like Fee was saying, you know, if, if you can run things virtually, it opens up such a pool of talent, but also, you know, for people who are less abled or, or who struggle to commute every day or have other responsibilities like unwell parents or even someone was running a marathon on our team. So doing training um, in daylight in winter, if you're a woman, is, is quite hard when you're working in an office and you have to commute. So yeah, I think I think in our opinion, you know, we we, we want people to live that life of, you know, almost like normality um, and and not be stopped by work. If you want to do your work in the evening or early morning, what difference does that actually make as long as you reach, reach the deadline? Um, These I think it's really powerful. It's really great tips here. I really think mm. it's a mindset shift to really yeah. understand the whole person and taking yeah. that empath em empathetic approach. Mm. While we're on this, I mean, can you think of any other learnings that you've had or any tips that you can share for others who might be struggling with it because it's it's mm. it's newer to them? I think lead by example. Um, at whatever level you are at the business, um, you know, I. I We'll go on Slack and say, I'm going for a walk now. Um, or, you know, I'm, I'm changing my hours today. We, um, I think the other big tip is communication, which some agencies aren't great at. But the way this works really well is that we are very, very transparent with each other, kind of where we are, when we're online, when we're not online. Um, and actually, you can use that to your advantage because, say, a creative says, you know, I'm around until two and then I'll be back online at six. Then that gives you four hours to go, right, well, I can review that work then, but I can take an hour off in the morning. So, you know, it's kind of looking at each other's needs as well and supporting each other. And that comes from strong teamwork and appreciation and understanding of each other as well. I love that. Just, you know, doing the uh, behaviours yourself so that it sets the benchmark for everybody else to think that it's okay. 
Absolutely. You know, and I think, I mean, I know you're both aware of it, but it wasn't it the Google study that said, talked about psychological safety, which is mm-hmm. essentially being, you know, not feeling like they're going to come down on you if you say like made a mistake or, you know, mm-hmm. something like that. So you are definitely creating that kind of environment. Yeah. yeah, we all learn through our mistakes at the end of the day, and we're all human beings. And actually, uh, the pandemic has taught us we've all had good days and bad days and actually supporting each other through those days, but actually saying, hands up, I'm having a really tough day today. My kids won't listen to me. I can't homeschool them. I, you know, it's it's <laughs> horrible. And actually, the life, the life work balance has started all it's kind of blurred during the pandemic, hasn't it? But actually, there is that acceptance of just embrace the chaos and then let's all get through this together. Mm-hmm. Um I would also say some of the learnings that we have uh, have been around processes and, you know, account managers love a good process, but equally, you know, look at it as a team, what's working really well, what's not working so well, how can we improve things? I mean, at Skin and Blister, there was one day where we, you know, we used to call things by traditional job numbers. And then there was one day we had this detail aid that kept coming back. And Joe on our team affectionately started calling this Arnie. Um, and we had another detail aid that was happening at the same time. And Cassie on the team was saying, gosh, that's helped me so much because I know which job we're talking about. And so we started calling this job Arnie. Our client loved it. And ever since then, we've given all of our projects uh, characters or symbols as names so that we understand what we're talking about. We can be talking about it confidentially, you know, confidentially when we're out and about as well. And from a farmer perspective, that's really important. Um, But the team came up with that. That was just a genius way of working. And yeah, it's okay to fail, but it's also it's brilliant to celebrate those successes. And how can we all improve things together? You know, I think that would be a top learning as a leader, as a founder, you don't don't know everything you can't possibly surround yourselves with people that want to just do brilliant work and are all enthusiastic and passionate too and then you will make it work together um, and that's the very best way how wonderful that you're empowering the team to come back with ideas and then embracing them because that shows you know no idea is a bad idea just let's let's co-create this whole thing together which is interestingly what I was talking to about yesterday with web three and I don't know I'd love to talk to you maybe on another thing but how you know it's going to be about community creating uh organizations which is fascinating so I mean I'm I don't want to squeeze you dry for tips but there's a few things that I've I the few people that I've spoken to specifically and I think you mentioned it Fee that they're still still struggling with this you know this idea that junior members of the team are obviously working from home and a their home circumstances aren't ideal maybe they're sharing with mates or whatever and two they don't feel that they're benefiting from watching more senior people manage the client conversation mm. is any tips or any advice for how to kind of tackle that scenario uh, yes, I mean, again, be really open and honest about what you can do virtually together. Um, jump on calls, uh, whether it be on the telephone, over Zoom or whatever, just to kind of ask all those questions. There's no silly questions, but I think as an account manager, certainly when you're in the more junior role, you only learn by asking those questions and hearing that insight from your uh, leaders in your team. Um, and we're quite upfront with our clients. We'll say, you know, we've got a new team member, we'd love them to join in the meetings, we won't be charging you for those meetings, some of them are observational, you know, it's just learning the skills, sometimes they come on and they don't say anything, because it's about confidence as well, but of course we'll introduce them, but their expectation is you don't have to say anything, but I want you to kind of just listen and learn and absorb it all, so yeah, it, it, is, it is a challenge, there's no ways around it, you know, it, it is a challenge when you're not all in the office together, but I think it's about putting that investment in your, you know, in your day to really support your juniors but also kind of let them do some things on their own as well um and yeah be really open about okay I really feel like we need to get together can we just get together for a coffee and talk about this project together or let's sit down and do the timelines together or whatever it's yeah it's very much sort of give and take um but also try not to kind of overcrowd people as well and don't stifle um the ability um and just help their confidence to grow really Wow, that's a really good answer. So you're empowering them on the one hand, you know, you go ahead, get it done. But on the other hand, you know, if there was a need, if there was a a situation where you could get them to watch how you operated, then telling the client in advance, you know, we want someone to be observing, 
you're not going to be charged. This is not part of the, but we as a learning, I mean, how lovely and how simple and how kind of easy to do. So I think, thank you for sharing that. That's amazing. Um, another one that came up this morning was um, a manager was concerned, feeling concerned that they were not checking in enough with people, mm-hmm. that they he had the feeling that they were being left and he was worried that, you know, am I checking in enough? Mm-hmm. Any kind of thoughts or tips on that one? That's a difficult one. Um, someone on our team was off sick last week and I didn't know, you know, beyond the kind of, how are you doing in the morning text? So I was like, God, I don't even know if they're right. But then I was like, I don't want to be that person. So I think it's still something that we struggle with. Um, I think, I think you need to create a culture whereby people are proactive. Um, we ask everyone on the team to actually over communicate about certain things um, because one, it kind of helps them. And, and two, it helps us know where everybody is, because obviously, as you can imagine, everyone's in and out all the time. And um, so I think there is an element of that. Um, I guess as a manager, I would empower that manager to ask, you know, how much trust is there between him and the people that work for him? And can he look at building that trust any further? Um, because there might be an underlying kind of trust issue or a visibility or maybe a hangover from the past or when they're in the office or even moving online with the pandemic. I think um, it is it is a fine line, but you, again, like he said, also you could ask the team member what they prefer. Like, would they like their manager to check in with them every day? Or is the once weekly meeting enough until that next meeting that you have in the diary? Um, I think it's very individual. Right, and a theme, a theme that's coming through for me is kind of not assuming uh, just yeah. ask, actually asking first, which again, I know it sounds so simple when we talk about it, but actually it's overlooked. So yeah. thank you for that. Final question, only because these are actual people that have been not asking me. Um, okay. The last scenario was, yes, before everyone seemed to spend a lot more time as a team going out for lunch, going out for drinks, and there was this real kind of unit. Since the everyone going kind of virtual, some people prefer the home scenario and want to stay there. Some people can't wait to get back. And the concern of the, the agency leader was that I want to keep the team together. And I think she was feeling that loss of, oh, is this okay? Because it's just a bit disjointed now. So any kind of observations from what I've just said that might be going on? I'm giggling because I'm thinking about, um, we did, so we, we used to go out, out. And then in the pandemic, we went in, in. Um, and we had a, cra- <laughs> we just did a crazy night of like games and quizzing and even that was around the team as well. You know, it was like at Christmas we do, everyone submits their Christmas tree picture and then everyone has the guests. So we do whose pine is there anyway. Um, <laughs> it's all a bit mad actually. <laughs> I don't know if we should do this on a podcast. <laughs> no, it's not honestly, this has been so helpful so far. Just carry on. It's great. <laughs> I was gonna say like on people's birthdays everyone brings an object in their house we have a we set a theme and then everyone brings a gift and you gift it to the person and tell them why but in my head now that sounds a bit (laughs) crazy as well (laughs) but it it encourages the whole team to like think about each other and it's not Mm. going down the pub and yelling at each other on a Friday night when the music's loud and you've had four pints and you haven't had dinner it's like how, what's the quality time there you know <laughs> or but going to a weekly meeting and going here you go V I've brought you a unicorn for your birthday um I, and I've thought about why it's actually to me that's a lot more quality um and I think that's quite powerful Lovely. yeah and I'd look for like common you know what can you continue even if you've got yeah. some of you in the office and you haven't you know slack to us is an essential agency tool you know we communicate yeah. in gifts and emojis half the time which incidentally some of our team create <laughs> their own emojis or gifts to represent how they're feeling but you know if you've got some people at home and some of you are in the office can you still all use slack to still communicate as if you're all still in there yeah. and all together anyway you know what can you do that can ensure that underlying thread of communication but it doesn't really matter where you are at that moment in time I would look for 
look for opportunities like that um there's no question it's it is hard you know it's like when we've run meetings with clients where you've got some in the room and some you know remotely it's really hard to make sure that everyone feels feels included but it's really worth that time and investment to do it because it's really important that everybody feels like they're all experiencing things in as similar way as you possibly can i mean i don't know if it's obvious but also having your video on so mm. we are when we when we went and watched tomorrow the first thing we did after we went home from that was we going right every Tuesday we're going to ask everyone to put their video on and, and that was a big change for us like a big change and some people it took them weeks to put their video on and now uh, there isn't a call without a video on you know so we've developed that over time but I don't know if all the agencies do it and I don't know if I don't know if that's an obvious one but for me think about your mental health think about seeing people's reactions in their faces and you can learn from them and um you know the tool is there um it's not the same as being next to somebody but you know it's covid safe and it's honestly you know so it, it's quite good for now so i think that's a very obvious one that can be encouraged i think that's a great tip as well um i was i was looking as part of my research for this talk i've got coming up i was looking at different the evolution of the Zooms and the Teams and what's coming mm. next. And I found quite some interesting uh, new kind of more, I don't know, 3D platforms, which I thought were quite interesting. I mean, I don't know if you've come across it, but it's called Spatial.io. Have you heard of it? No. Uh, and I, it creates different workspaces that are very creative. And you've got a video of you, but you've also got a little avatar and you move around and it, it kind of simulates different environments and you can create your own environments, your own worlds. I thought it was super clever and I'll share the link with you afterwards. But um, yeah, I thank you again for sharing so many insights and tips. This has been brilliant. Um, I want to talk about account management because account management is obviously part of your background fee and mine as well and this is the podcast is principally about account management so for you what makes an exceptional account manager well I think um going back to the days where I was an account director working for you Jenny I mean I learned so much from you at um you Let's know see, I'm not paying days. her to say this for that. <laughs> Jenny is my Yoda, as I like to say, you know, she taught me everything I know. Yeah, I mean, I think there's so many facets to an amazing account manager. I think, um, firstly, it's being really great and a uh, fantastic listener. So to be able to really listen to what's going on and evaluate what actually the challenges are, um, either kind of within your team or also with clients as well asking fantastic questions. I love it when somebody goes, sorry, I've got so many questions. It's like, yes, ask away, ask away. You know, let's really get under the skin of what's going on. Um, tailoring your the way that you communicate with people. You know, I think one of the key things for a great account manager is to really think about your clients. And you've got so many different types. I mean, actually, a lot of our clients are real drivers. So they are people that just they don't have the chat that you pick up the phone to them. They're like, right, OK, tell me what I need to do. When do you need it for? You know, they just want to get on with that. And we completely tailor our communications with them so differently to the clients that love to talk about their weekend, you know, what's going on in their lives, what concert they're going to that night or whatever. And actually, some of the best things you can do as an account manager is focus your time and investment into really understanding the person you're talking to then think about the way um, that you communicate with them to get either your message across or how you're going to sell in some of your ideas um, and also just to um, yeah ask those fantastic questions you know what does success look like what do you really need um, it's all about that understanding but it's ultimately about being quite a perceptive person I think um, you think they're born or made Oh, that's a good question. You know, I've been thinking about this quite a lot recently because I think as we're trying to recruit an account manager at the moment and it's trying to find that perfect person. I think your strengths are inherent in you, but you don't necessarily know you're an account manager. <laughs> you have people that come to you and they're like, oh, I don't really know where I fit. But actually, when you see it straight away, you know, if somebody's really comfortable sat with their camera on talking to a client, asking them what's going on in their lives, you know, they, they've got the potential to be a great account manager. Um, not being scared by the word strategy. Um, you know, I remember as an account exec and account manager being so daunted by that word, feeling like it had to be this big, 
giant thing you know strategy can be so delicate and so clever um it's really thinking about emotional and rational reasons that people may change isn't it and uh you know either buy something or don't buy something you know it's to make a real positive change on somebody um so yeah i think i would say maybe there's there's an element of being born but i think great account yeah. managers you've got that potential and you know you really want to work hard at it focus on the people side of it and then the rest of it can can be learned you know strategy can be learned for sure yeah. i just would like to add as well i think it often gets forgotten but our product is creative you know we sell healthcare creative remarkable healthcare communications so for me a great account manager also has a creative side to them they go to inspirational spaces they like to you know be inspired um, and they can sit in front of the client eventually you know when they get to kind of higher levels account director senior account manager and help you sell in that 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 creative vision to a client and I think sometimes we forget and it becomes very process driven but actually our you know our, our main product is, is creative so that side for me needs to be there as well love it inspiring the client and communication skills I mean it's all yeah. come up thank you so much that was really good kind of overview I mean do, what do you personally what are some of the greatest lessons that you've both had when it comes to client management and, and being in that in that position don't panic <laughs> great advice <laughs> <laughs> you know you can handle anything and ultimately yes your client you want to please them you want them to do you know they want them to be so thrilled I think the account manager's worst world in the word in the world is disappointed I think you know anybody that sees that come through on an email your heart sinks you want to go home and just stick your head in a bucket of gin don't you <laughs> um so you know don't panic everything can be sold you know everything you can mm. work out um and yeah, I just, that would be, I think my biggest one. What would you say, Katie? <laughs> I just say disappointing is the worst word for a creative as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I'm so sorry, I've forgotten the question. <laughs> Sorry. No, well, the greatest lessons, you know, when you're managing oh, client relationships, yes. either for um, you, Katie, yeah. observing how account managers operate or mm. yourself dealing with clients. I find it really tough. <laughs> I, I, I have such admiration and respect for any anyone that works in account management because um, I think we're quite lucky, Fee and I, because we're quite, we can do a lot of different roles. So sometimes we swap and sometimes, you know, if Fee, when Fee got COVID, for example, you know, I was speaking to clients and client facing and driving that bit of the business, but I was so, so happy when she came back. <laughs> Just like, yeah I, I, I'm kind of in awe of, of anybody that works in account management for keeping their cool for being so um, calm under pressure like he says don't panic um, and just um, yeah I think the organization skills of a lot of the kind of project management side of it just blow, blow my tiny mind <laughs> as creators are not known for being the most organized and I, I think as well like you know, adapting your style to your team as well as your clients, because creatives are very varied. Um, you know, also we work with developers who are another another kind of personality um, and studio and all of the different, you know, directors. Um, I think a great account, account manager can look at the person in front of them and think, you know, how, do, how can I help this person? How can I, you know, get, you know, get the work done in a way that's going to be positive for both of us and also manage the work through in a way that that they'll be comfortable with mm, brilliant brilliant tips um I, I love that you've both brought up this adapting your own style to maximize you know your ability to influence your ability to communicate because it is about thinking about yourself first and thinking right what's going to work well in this scenario and I think that I think you mentioned it for the um for the em emotional emotional quotient you know I think um, one of the things that I'm there's there's two tests that I like to suggest people do. One is a listening test and one is an EQ test. And, you know, if you are interested in pursuing this as a career, I think getting an evaluation of where your strengths lie in both areas will help you enhance and kind of accelerate what you're already good at. And I, I would agree that inherently, I think a lot of account managers are super kind of super communicators and they love they enjoy the interaction you know yeah 
Absolutely. And don't be afraid to ask for feedback. That's the Mm, other thing I would say. You can learn so much by your line manager. You know, if you go to a meeting, ask them afterwards, how did I handle that conversation? What could I have done better? Um, Because you can learn so much through that. And sometimes you have to have quite honest conversations. Um, Somebody rephrased it for me the other day, you know, rather than a difficult conversation, it's a courageous conversation. And I think that's a lovely way of putting it. You know, be brave, ask, because that's the best way to improve. Um, And then enjoy it when you've done something really well, enjoy it and learn from it. And, you know, it's, it should be fun at the end of the day. It should be a great (laughs) fun job. And it really is, you know, it's, it's really a fantastic Uh, It's quite a privilege, isn't it, to be working with some amazing clients and you are a bit of a diplomat. You have to be in the middle and try to smooth things over and make sure everybody's happy. But when it works, wow, it's fantastic. It really is awesome when you see someone good at account management and you just watch how they kind of work the room and get everybody in in alignment. And it's just quite magical. And it happens so subtly sometimes. And I love that tip about asking for feedback. And one of the tips I also share with people is, you know, because we're in a virtual world, record yourself, record a session, play it back and just watch yourself. I know it's agonizing sometimes, but I know I did it. I mean, I still do it myself. I mean, I record a lot of my training sessions and one session, oh my God, I didn't crack a smile in the first 20 minutes. I actually looked like resting bitch face. And I thought, (laughs) that's not how I felt. That's certainly not how I wanted to come across. So it's a good kind of wake up call sometimes just to watch how you, what you emanate, what what energy do you, do you look welcoming? Is a client going to want to interact with you? Or do you look a little bit sort of scary and standoffish? Anyway, brilliant tips. Thank yeah, and you. I would say um, we got a top tip actually from a friend, a friend of Katie's um, who said, before you go to a meeting, have three words in your head about how you want to turn up that day. And it could be fun, inspiring, energetic. It could be like that. It could be like, you know, scientific, serious, whatever. Think about that before you go to that meeting, before you have those conversations and make sure you turn up that way. And I think we've always thought that is such a brilliant tip. That's amazing. That's a fantastic tip. I haven't heard that one before. So thank you. Love that. Um, I'd love to, now I've got you both on the call. I'd love to know, just in uh, turning our attentions to healthcare comms, because that's your speciality. What, what do you see as the most significant, significant trends happening, you know, over the next maybe five to 10 years in the healthcare communication space? Well, I think we've learned during the pandemic that um, healthcare communications have amazing power and actually bad healthcare communications, essentially they cause lost lives. Um, You know, misinformation can cause lost lives or lost education. You know, it's so important. Healthcare communications is vital to every single body on this planet. Um, And that's what gets us out of bed every day. And that's what really excites us. I mean, I was in a supermarket recently and I overheard two ladies and they were, Uh, sort of saying oh did you get the AstraZeneca vaccine or the Pfizer vaccine and there's never been a time like this where pharmaceutical companies are so in you know everybody's minds we're all talking about it we're using brand names Um, and that's actually a huge responsibility and we've got to get this right you know we we have to (laughs) for the human race for us all to kind of survive and do really really well Um, and Yeah, I think it's a very exciting future from a communications point of view, but also from a technology point of view um, and also clinical trials as well. You know, we've seen what happens when the world, when scientists all come together and work together as a team, how quickly you can develop amazing medicines that can save lives. You know, that's that's fantastic. So I think there's a, a real energy around clinical trials, which I'm really happy to see. It's an area we work in. And actually, there's a real problem with getting patients to go onto clinical trials and stay on them. Um, and this is a massive opportunity to do things properly and to do things right. Um, there's also the technology side of things and, you know, with smart watches and all these things out there that can monitor our health and Alexa, who can remind us about our tablets that we need to take. And, you know, I think it's fascinating um, to see where technology and science could kind of meet and come together to improve the lives for everyone. Amazing. And you're right. I mean, the, the, the fact that the vaccine was brought to market so quickly Whereas it's taken, how, I don't know, how many years usually does it take to come to yeah. market? Um, it's astounding, that, yeah. It, it is astounding. 
Um, okay, thank you so much for sharing that. So listen, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much. I've squeezed you dry, haven't I? I've, I've absolutely squeezed you dry for tips. Any more tips? Um, but how? who would you like to be contacted by and how can people reach you if they'd like to further the conversation? Like we mentioned, we are recruiting for account managers at the moment. We're expanding our team. So we would love to hear from anybody who is passionate about healthcare communications. You know, if you want to get up every day and work on brands that change people's lives we would love to hear from you um we are on linkedin um but you can also look us up at skinandblister.agency our website and we'd love to hear from you um equally anybody who is you know finding that um dilemma of going from office to virtual back you know hybrid whatever if you need any tips you know katie and i we have learned over the last few years some of those as we've kind of mentioned today but there's there's tons of ideas so we're always really happy to jump on a quick call with anybody and uh, and help and support because it's for the benefit of everybody thank you so much and i would like to vouch for you if i was starting my account management career again i would certainly want to work with you two because i just from everything you've said i mean if that's not an advert for working in your agency i don't know what it is because it was phenomenal. Thank you both so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having Thank us, you. Jenny.